First Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 18 through 22 here this morning. Now in our text this morning, Peter is continuing his look at one of the most difficult issues that we as Christians have to deal with. And that is suffering for doing what is right. Now we addressed this in our previous study in, in great detail. And yet in this particular text, what Peter does is he gives us a couple of examples of people who suffered. And they suffered for righteousness sake. They did the right thing and yet they still suffered. And he does this so that you might realize you're not alone. Now this is a struggle that every one of us has dealt with or we will deal with. You see, there's that, there's a natural sense of fairness that we have inside of us all. And so when you do something nice for someone and then they turn around and they are offensive, evil, hurtful, you just, you think to yourself, what's the deal here? I did the right thing. Why are you doing this? Why are you saying this? Why are you taking this action? And so we struggle with it. It's a natural thing. And so what Peter does is he addresses now some examples of people who have done the very, and experienced the very same thing. Read with me. Verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So where does Peter begin with these examples? He begins with the ultimate example. The perfect son of God. He did not do one sin. Not one thing did he do to deserve the suffering that he experienced. And so Christ is our ultimate example. And Peter wants to address this issue and his example for a very important reason. Because if the perfect Son of God suffered, then how should I think I should not suffer? I am the unjust. I, or I am the the unjust one, and he is the just one. And so that is why he declares here, he suffered the just for the unjust. Now many times when we suffer as Christians, we say, I, I don't understand. Lord, what is the purpose for this? There are some things that we experience in life that we just say, I don't get this, Lord. I don't get why this is taking place. This suffering seems absolutely pointless. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever watched someone else go through something and you just go, Lord, what are you doing here? Why is this allowed? Why did this take place? Or maybe it happened to you. And you think, oh, it's pointless. There is no point. Well, if there's anybody who could have said that, it would be the perfect Son of God. But he knew exactly the eternal purpose, the reason why he suffered. And what was that? It was for you and me. It was so that he could purchase our salvation. So there is a redemptive purpose for suffering. There is a redemptive purpose for his suffering. 
which means there is a redemptive purpose for your suffering. So that is the point that Peter is addressing here. If he uses the ultimate example of suffering, the perfect Son of God, I put myself into those shoes and I say, well, I've done a whole lot to deserve suffering. I have done a whole lot of things wrong. And so the comparison is what he is trying to address. Now, when you look at your own life and you try and determine what's the redemptive purpose of this suffering that I'm going through, if you suffer for righteousness sake, you suffer for speaking up and taking a stand for Christ, well, obviously it's because, as I addressed in our previous study, they hated him. And Jesus said, they will also hate you. If you stand for him, the world hates Jesus. They hate what he stands for. They will hate you as well. But what happens when that takes place is you enter into what the Bible calls the fellowship of his sufferings. Let me read to you this passage in Philippians 3.10. Paul prayed there. He said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, most people that quote this passage stop right there. I like that part. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want that supernatural power inside of me. But the very next phrase says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Well, I don't want that. I want the power, but I don't want the sufferings that come with it. And then the next phrase, being made conformable to his death. Now, do you want to die to self? Die and to self so that you can be conformed to Christ? Well, that requires death to self. And that requires fellowship of his sufferings. So you are going to if you love Christ, if you stand up for Him, if you speak up for Him, then I can guarantee you, you will suffer for the cause of Christ. It's going to happen. If you want to be a secret disciple and never let anybody know that you're a Christian, I guarantee you, you will, you will be spared a whole lot of suffering. But you will be denying the one who suffered for you. If he was willing to suffer for me, am I willing to suffer for him? But that is something we don't want to do. That's where the fear that we have of speaking up, of making him known, of taking a stand for what's morally right, it's going to happen. You say, well, this is the United States, Steve. That doesn't happen here. Oh, it happens all the time. I mean, have you heard the, the stories of the Christian baker up in the northern part of our country who took a stand and said, I, for conscience sake, cannot bake a wedding cake for a same-sex marriage. Well, they've been put out of business, they've been sued, and they have had their personal home picketed by hundreds of demonstrators wanting literally to shame these people for taking a stand that they feel is morally wrong. And they say, I don't want to partake in this. Or the photographer that won't take the pictures at a same-sex marriage. Or people who even speak up about the issue. You are looked at as the intolerant one, as the bigot. And that's happening right here in our country. And that's just one moral issue. There are plenty more. And when you stand up, you speak up, you are going to suffer for that. Now, another way that we enter into his sufferings are, I think probably most of us in this room have already experienced these ways. Simply, have you ever had somebody that you really care about a good friend that loves the Lord, that you've ministered to, helped, served, and then they turn their back on Christ. 
or they get angry with you because you're trying to share the gospel with them? What does that make you feel like? Well, it doesn't feel good, does it? How about a son or a daughter or some family member that you love and you've ministered to, maybe you even led to Christ, and they turn away from the Lord? What does that feel like? It doesn't feel good. And I remember the first time this happened to me, and I realized, you know what? This is what you feel like, Lord. I mean, if I have this hurt in my heart by being rejected by a, somebody I love... How much more do you hurt when you are rejected by the ones that you created, the ones that you pursued and touched and saved, and then they turn away from you? I mean, that's, that's hurtful, but the Lord experiences that every day to the nth degree. And I experience it just a small bit. That is entering into the fellowship of his sufferings. So when you think there is no redemptive purpose, remember the sufferings of Christ. There was an eternal purpose. It says in Ephesians 3, 11, Paul said, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. If there was a an eternal purpose for Christ going to the cross, there is and are eternal purposes for why you suffer. Some you are going to understand, some you are not going to understand. Some you're not going to understand and later will come to understand. Remember the disciples, did they get why Christ went to the cross? Or were they totally confused, completely depressed, having no hope until after the resurrection. Then they go, oh, I get it. Okay. So if they were completely lost for any purpose or reason for what was taking place, don't think it's strange if you come to that place. Because I've been there many times, and I'm going to have to wait until heaven to get an answer for why did that take place? Why did that happen? I don't know but I do know you love me and you sent your son to die for me. And that is the ultimate proof that there is a reason, there is a purpose. This is not all pointless, the suffering that I'm experiencing. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, there the apostle encouraged believers, again, who were suffering greatly. Uh, The latter part of Hebrews is dealing with their suffering and their struggle. He said, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How do you do that? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was that joy? obtaining you and me. That's what he fixed his attention on. The joy that he was going to save multitudes, a number which no man can number. And he will continue to until that day. And so he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So if you want to find that endurance, you've got to look to Him. You've got to pray. You've got to trust. But you've got to keep your eyes fixed on Him. He is your ultimate example. Now one thing before we leave this 18th verse here and go on to this next point, one little side note here. This, the latter part of this verse is translated by the Jehovah Witnesses incorrectly in their New World Translation so that they can establish their belief in the fact that Jesus did not rise bodily from the grave. They translate this passage, having been put to death in the flesh but made alive, and they say, in the spirit, or in spirit. But the way it is translated here is exactly correct, according to 
all the Greek scholars, they say it should be by the Spirit. The Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus said, I will raise myself from the dead. He said, you take my life. He said, I have the power to raise it up again. He said, I have the power to raise it up again. And then another passage, it says the Father raised Jesus from the dead. So who raised him from the dead? God raised him from the dead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Very important instruction. But how do we know that Jesus rose bodily from the grave, that he wasn't just some kind of spirit? Well, let me read to you this passage. In Luke 24, verses 37 through 39. This is referring to the disciples after the resurrection. It says, They were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. That should be enough for you. Jesus made it very clear to these guys, I'm not some spirit. Come, take hold of my hands, my feet, touch me. I am not a spirit. I have bodily risen from the grave. In John 2, 18 and 19, after the, Jesus had cleansed the temple, it says the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? In other words, what authority do you have to come in here and drive out the money changers? And he answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they, of course, thought he was talking about the physical temple. But in verse 21 of the same passage, there John said, this he spoke of his body, the temple of his body. So Jesus was making it very clear. I am going to rise again bodily from the grave. So, very important. You will be raised bodily. You will have a physical but yet spiritual body. It says in Romans 8, 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to what? your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And so if you are alive and you remain to the coming of Christ, He will change you like that instantaneously. If you die before His second coming or the rapture of the church, He will change you. He will give you a new body and yet it will be a spiritual body like the one you have. The scripture makes it very clear that after the resurrection, many of the Old Testament saints walked around the city of Jerusalem, which probably blew everybody's mind. And yet they were known as Moses or Noah or Abraham. And we will know each other in that way when we are in heaven. So yet we're going to have a new body. A spiritual body and some of you like me are just you can hardly wait for that body because this one is not doing too well now let's go on to the next issue why would Peter bring up this point here in verse 19 that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison and he starts talking about Noah and all the people that were before the flood that died in faith. And only Noah was saved with his family. I mean, why does he bring this subject up? A very important reason. You see, the people who died in faith before the cross, before the resurrection, where did they go? What happened to them? The people who died in unbelief, where did they go? What happened to them? What, does God just forget about those people? Does he leave them behind? Not at all. 
This particular statement here is just a little side note by Peter to make sure that the people who are suffering in the day he was writing knew that God would not forget one of them. He said, no, he went after his death, after he died, before his resurrection, he went and he preached to the spirits in prison. Notice, go over to chapter 4 and verse 6. He brings this up again. He says, For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, those, again, who are died in faith, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. So Peter brings this issue up twice briefly. Now, the point of this is that so often people think when they're suffering I'm the only one suffering that's why he brings Christ up as the ultimate example but they also think God doesn't know what I'm going through he doesn't really see what I'm going through he has not a clue and here obviously Peter is bringing this up to allow these people to realize look he does know so where did Christ go after his crucifixion He went into the prison. Now, the Bible declares that Hades was separated into two particular areas. I'm going to read you the passage in just a moment. Abraham's bosom, or paradise, was one of them. There was a gulf fixed between the two, and those who died in unbelief were in the other side, in torment. And this is what was like before the cross. So let me read to you this story. This is what Jesus taught. Luke 16, 19. Now this is not a parable because Jesus never uses a person's personal name in a parable. People like to say this is a parable, but it's not. He's telling an actual story of something that happened to an act, two individuals. It says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, but he went someplace after burial. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Remember, Jesus is the one teaching this. Verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that, they may, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, or said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And they were not persuaded after Christ rose from the dead. Why? Because they didn't believe the law and the prophets to begin with. So Jesus here makes this very clear. This is where these people went when they died. Now, is that the way it is today? No, it's not. The scripture declares that after his crucifixion, as it says here in Peter and other places we're going to read in just a minute, he went and he preached to them. What did he preach to them? 
He proclaimed to them that their sins were put away. Up to, until the cross of Christ, men's sins were only covered. And you see that particular term used over and over in the Old Testament, that their sins were covered. But in the New Testament, it says this in Hebrews 9, 26. It says, Now, once at the end of the ages, He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. So, literally, the Bible teaches that a person could not be justified as we are justified today with their sins being put away. They were justified having only their sins covered. This is declared again in Acts 13.39. It says, Everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So that's the message that Paul preached as he went from synagogue to synagogue. Your sins are covered, but they need to be put away. And if you will believe in him, you can be justified from all things. Now, is that some things? All things. So anything that any one of us has ever done in this room, you can be justified from completely declared righteous from if you will put your faith in him and that is the glorious gospel that we proclaim to others so this is an explanation of what took place at the crucifixion he went preached to these spirits in prison and then in ephesians 4 8 and 9 this is what paul declared this is a verse that gives people great difficulty they go i don't get this well, now you will. It says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. So the captivity of these that died in faith, he led captive. And he gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So he descended, proclaimed that their sins were put away, he led them captive. A few of them walked around the city of Jerusalem to blow everybody's minds. And then he led them into heaven. And that's where they are today. When a person dies in faith today, they go directly to be with him. 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord. And he has a new body that is eternal there in the heavens waiting for you. So this is an encouragement from Peter to just remind these people, look, God doesn't leave anybody behind. He doesn't forget one individual. He will complete what he begins. And that's what he's done here. In Psalm 9, 12, it says this, he does not forget the cry of the humble. What a glorious thought is that. He will not forget you. He didn't forget these people. And he will come for you. Now the third and last uh, thing here this morning is the second example of Noah. Now why does Peter bring Noah? Well, for very similar reasons... Because Noah suffered, he was a righteous man, he suffered, but one little thing that's different about Noah, he escaped. He escaped the judgment. He was not killed. He was not put to death. Now that is a revelation and an important thing. This particular example is here for a reason. Christ died, suffered, died. Noah suffered, escaped. Now, do you realize that that can take place in any one of our lives? Some of us will escape. Some of us are not going to escape. And trying to understand and get your head around that is very difficult to understand. But the scripture makes it clear that men and women of faith, you can have one of those two results. 
and ends. Let me show you this in the book of Hebrews. Now, chapter 11 of Hebrews is, of course, the hall of faith. It's a description of all the men and women of faith. Now, notice this. Hebrews 11.32. He says, What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Notice that word, escaped. Very important. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And then all of a sudden he says, others. Now, the first part of this is we say, oh, I want that. I, I want to stop the mouths of lions. I want the dead raised. I want to be, I want to escape. And that is the result of many of, that walk in faith. But others didn't escape. They were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mocking and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. I wouldn't have wanted to done that. And were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and the caves of the earth. And all of these obtained a good testimony through faith. So all of these people, whether they escaped or whether they were tormented, were men and women of faith. That's the point. And then he says, and they did not receive the promise, referring to their actually seeing the Messiah. They believed that the Messiah was coming, but they never saw him. They died in faith not seeing the, the ultimate end of that promise. So this is the reality. I mean, there, we live in the United States here, and we are spared incredible suffering that people around the world are not spared. I mean, there is a, a pastor, Pastor Saeed Abedini, who is a Calvary Chapel pastor from Calvary Chapel, Boise, Idaho, a fr- good friend of mine pastors that church. And that man is in an Iranian prison today. If you follow his story, I hope you do, and I hope you've uh, signed the petitions that are online that are going around the world because they are having an effect. He was beaten severely in prison. He has internal injuries, and they would not give him any medical care. The Petitions that have been signed have brought enormous international pressure upon the Iranian government. But these people are barbaric, and they do not care. And they look at Pastor Saeed as an apostate, and worthy of death. That is their belief system. And so they've taken him to a hospital, and just this past week he was taken back to the prison without any medical care. Again, enormous and international pressure came upon the, the Iranian government. They took him back to the hospital, but they are not giving him any care. He may die there. That is a real reality. But he's only one of the pastors, the men and the women in Iran who are standing up for their faith. And they are in, well, you wouldn't want to be in their prison. I've I've read the stories of what it's like inside that prison. It's not like anything in this country, I guarantee you. But that's just one country. How about the Christians that are in prison in Sudan, in Indonesia, in China? There are multitudes of countries around this globe where Christians 
are imprisoned and being persecuted and suffering, and many of them are going to die in those prisons. I guarantee you. So I hope you're praying for them uh, because anything is possible. Anything can change. There is a great change taking place in this country today, right now. And Christians are begun, it's beginning to look like we are the intolerant ones. We're the bigots. We're the ones that are really hindering the progressiveness of our nation. And so persecution can come. It can turn. So if you think it can't, you're kidding yourself. Just read history. There are many republics that have died. And this republic can die. If Christians do not stand up and speak up, we are, this country is going down. So I hope that you're seriously considering this. Now notice here, he goes on and he says, Noah. Noah is a great example. He's an example of perseverance. He persevered in his ministry, and though, though he had very little fruit, eight souls, that's it. So would you labor for a hundred years building a boat that God told you to build and only save eight people? That's pretty powerful. That's a man of perseverance. It's a man of faith. Noah is a perfect example. And literally, the flood is a, a beautiful example of the rapture of the church as well. Because, you see, judgment came to the world, but there was salvation and escape from that judgment by Noah and his family. And so, it's a beautiful picture of deliverance from the judgment to come. And that is why I believe that the church will be raptured before the great tribulation and the judgment that is coming on our land. But notice here, the, the term, the man Noah, I mean, do you, do you question whether Noah and the flood really happened? If you do, I, I, you're in opposition to Peter, you're in opposition to Paul, you're in opposition to Jesus because they all believed Noah was a real guy and the flood really happened. If you struggle with that, I want to encourage you, go to our website, calvaryag.org, and go on our apologetics page. There are several stories there or several articles there that refer to the evidence for the flood. And there is a ton of it. You probably have, if you doubt the, the flood, you've probably never heard this evidence. But it's there. On the highest peaks on Mount Everest to the Andes, there are fossils of sea life embedded in the ground, in the sedimentary rock. How did that sea life get there? Because one day it was covered by the sea. So that's fact. It's proof. And there are plenty of pictures to prove it. So that's just one of the evidences. I would encourage you to go there and study. Now notice he says here at the end of verse 20, he said that he waited, that God waited in his patience. That is why the flood, he waited so long because of his, his divine patience. And notice then in verse 21, he goes on to say, this is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Now again, this is another very difficult portion of Scripture that people say, I don't get this. Why is he bring baptism up into this right now? Well, it's very simple. There is the, the flood is a type of salvation. The ark is a type of Christ. And as long as you're in the ark, you're saved. If you're not in the ark, you are doomed. And so the antitype is baptism because he's talking about here being saved through water. And so Peter takes this and he says, 
Now, this is an antitype. A type means a symbol. An antitype is a corresponding symbol. So these, the, the flood literally happened, but it's also a picture of salvation. Baptism is also a picture of salvation. It is not how someone is saved. It is a type. It's a picture, a symbol of salvation. So when you go down in the water, you are burying yourself in Christ and you are burying your sins. As you come up out of the water, it's coming up in newness of life. This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. He said, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death symbolically? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. In the likeness of his death. You see, that shows you that baptism is a type of how a person is saved. So by faith, you enter in to the waters of baptism and you are raised to life in Christ. Now, lest anybody misunderstand what Peter is saying, because Peter, he was, he was listening to the Holy Spirit at this moment, because he interprets his own words here. Notice he says here, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. You see, it's not an issue of cleansing the outer or external part of your body. That is not the salvation he's talking about. He's talking about the change of the inside of you. The living water comes in to cleanse your conscience. Now, if there is one thing that I have seen take place in people that I have led to Christ personally, is this lifting and clearing of a person's conscience. I can't tell you how many people I prayed with and they, they open their eyes after they finished praying and receiving Christ and they look up and they, they get this smile on their face and they go, wow, what was that? And they have literally a physical sensation of God cleansing their, their sins and cleansing their conscience. Now, your conscience is what drives you. Your, your guilty conscience is what drives you to Christ in the first place. And so that is the first thing that he is going to free you from, the guilt of your conscience. And aren't we glad that he does that? Let me show you this in the scripture, in Hebrews 9, 14. There the apostle says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So the apostle is talking about salvation. And part of that salvation is getting your conscience cleansed. Notice how Paul addresses this in 1 Timothy 1.5. He says the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. If you have sincere faith, you're going to have a cleaned conscience, which is going to enable you to love others to love God and to love others. That's the purpose of God's commandment, to bring you to that place. So the conscience being cleansed is, is that sensation that you have that proves to you you have been forgiven. Your faith is sincere, and God has cleansed you from your sin. So rejoice in that. Salvation is not by baptism nor by any other work that you could ever possibly do. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says clearly, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
So there is no work that can save you. It is faith and faith alone that saves you. Now many times when you bring this subject up, people will read to you this verse, so I should hit it. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. I usually stop right there. But you can't stop in the middle of the verse. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Notice that he doesn't say he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. He says he who does not believe. Faith and faith alone justifies you and allows you to be righteous in his sight. And yet baptism is important. That's why Jesus says this here. He that believe and is baptized. It's a natural fruit of your faith. Baptism is essential. If you have not been baptized as a Christian, you're here today, I would encourage you. You need to get baptized. Why? Because it is a public confession of your faith that you believe that he died and rose again. So that is why you should do it. We're going to have a baptism in May. I hope you will sign up and get baptized. It is essential for your faith. It is not essential for your salvation. Okay? That's why the thief on the cross could be with Jesus that day in paradise. He didn't say, oh, no, no, wait a minute. You didn't get baptized? Sorry. That, that, you can't come with me. No. The man confessed Jesus as Lord. He believed in his heart that when Christ was risen from the dead, he would see him. He said, when you come into paradise, I, I want to be there. I want to be with you. Remember me. And he was. So I encourage you this morning, take these examples because they're, they're powerful examples. And remember, the last verse here, verse 22, he's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Everything and everyone will one day be subject to him. The question is, are you subject to him now? As a Christian, is everything in your life subject to him? Is it submitted to him? You see, you can be a Christian and not have him as Lord of your life. Not have him control everything in your life. You can be doing stuff that you know is wrong and you battle with. And that isn't going to help you at all. You've got to submit it to him. Make it subject to him by obeying him. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you haven't ever made that commitment to him, then nothing is subject to him. And you need to acknowledge your need, acknowledge your sin, and to follow him. That's what you need to do today. Don't leave here this morning without making that decision. In fact, I'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. Let's go to him in prayer right now. Father, we thank you today that, Lord, you are the just one and you died for each of us unjust ones. And, Lord, we give you praise for that. We acknowledge you. We give you praise for your incredible love towards us. And, Lord, I pray that you would touch any believer here any Christian here that has those issues that are not submitted, would you, as a believer, would you pray with me right now? Just say, Lord, I acknowledge this, name it, is not submitted to you. I bend my knee right now. I surrender to you take lordship over me completely. If you're praying that, God is doing that work right now. His Holy Spirit is 
taking control of that which you have submitted to him. And he will give you power to change and to turn. If, that, if you just prayed that with me, would you just acknowledge, yes, Steve, I prayed with you by lifting your hand. God bless you. Many hands here. Lord, touch these lives. Transform them. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you've never made that commitment, would you acknowledge your sin to him? Ask his forgiveness? Invite him to come in and take over your, your life? If you want to do that, we pray with me as well? Just say, Lord, I, I'm a sinner. I have broken your law. Forgive me. Jesus, come in, take over my life. I want to follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. If you're praying that prayer, you just prayed with me, would you lift your hand here this morning? I'd like to pray for you. Anyone here? Father, we give you praise this morning for your incredible grace that you have abounded towards us. Lord, help each one of us to partake of your grace this week. As we walk with you, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.